get involved and get activated in this last public comment session before the final draft rules are published through the OHA for the Oregon Cell Siphon Services system. My name, uh, as I said, is Evan Segura. I'm a previous president of Portland Psychedelic Society, now a humble volunteer. The Portland Psychedelic Society is a not-for-profit or organization based in Portland, Oregon. We build community through education, integration, and research of psychedelic medicines. And we host over 17 monthly integration circles and educational opportunities for the community to come together and connect and learn and share with each other. So if you're in Portland or you're passionate about uh, Portland Psychedelia, please get involved at portlandpsychedelic.org or find us on Meetup at Portland Psychedelic Society. You can also connect with us on Instagram at Portland Psychedelic. Um, if you want to donate to the Portland Psychedelic Society, uh, the links can, for that can be found in the chat box. Um, and if there are any friends of PPS that can post that um, now, that'd be sweet. But if you can't, that is okay. Uh, and I will do that shortly after I'm done talking. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure what else needs to be said. Um, so I will pass it over to John and he will take it from here. Thanks, Evan. And uh, thank you everyone for being here today. Um, it's, it's an exciting time uh, in Oregon for uh, kind of the Measure 109 uh, process. We are getting close to uh, program launch on January 2nd. And we have, uh, as Evan mentioned, uh, just entered into the final phase of public comment uh, running from uh, November 1st through November 21st. Um, so this is a, a special installment of the Eyes on Oregon uh, podcast series through uh, Psychedelics Today. And I wanted to thank uh, Portland Psychedelic Society for uh, co-sponsoring uh, today's uh, kind of installment. Uh, I, let me see if I can share screen here and figure this out. Okay, can uh, folks see that? Um, okay, so uh, today is November 9th and 2022. Uh, in case you're watching this later on the recording, I wanted to just uh, give a few disclaimers here uh, first off, uh, that the things that we discussed today are based on the rules that were published on November 1st. Uh, these rules will quickly become uh, kind of obsolete as final rules are adopted. So if you're watching this uh, in December, uh, after December 30th, when the rules are uh, published and finalized, uh, the information in here may not be accurate, so you may uh, wish to, uh, you know, not rely on uh, this information and instead uh, look for more uh, current information. Um, even though I'm an attorney, none of what is said here is legal advice. Uh, this is just intended as general information uh, based on draft rules, uh, as well as the Measure 109 statute itself. And of course, uh, in terms of conflicts of interest, I'd like to just disclose that I'm uh, the executive director and co-owner of uh, the Vital Oregon uh, program, which is uh, seeking to become a Oregon facilitator training program. Uh, it's through Psychedelics Today. Uh, and I'm also working on a community-based service center uh, project uh, through uh, with, with, some, with some colleagues and friends. So I have some uh, financial uh, kind of interest in this uh, that I don't think will cloud my uh, judgment uh, too much, or you're welcome to consider those as you weigh uh, the information presented here today. Um, so today being uh, the day after election day, there are some exciting updates. Uh, we have seen some pretty substantial uh, activity in Jackson County and Deschutes County, and uh, thankfully those uh, hard efforts have paid off, and we uh, they managed to defeat the uh, opt-out vote. Uh, so uh, Jackson County and Deschutes County, it appears that uh, psilocybin services will be legally offered uh, in those uh, areas as well as uh, Phoenix. Uh, there was a few disappointing uh, results from the uh, election as well uh, with respect to the Oregon opt-out uh, piece. Uh, we had four counties, uh, Clackamas, Clatsop, Curry, and Tillamook that voted for Measure 109 back in 2020. Uh, but that this year, just yesterday, voted against allowing uh, local uh, psilocybin activity in those areas. So um, 
that is a an interesting uh, piece that uh, it's unfortunate, but um, and of course most of rural Oregon also uh, decided to opt out. So um, it's just been a lot of work through the the dedicated efforts of activists and advocates in uh, especially Deschutes and Jackson counties. So congratulations to the folks there for their uh, success in in those efforts. Uh, also, uh, it appears that the Colorado uh, Proposition 122, also known as the Natural Medicines Health Act, or Healing Act, uh, is going to pass, uh, or did pass. Uh, I want to just reflect for uh, a brief moment on how uh, controversial uh, and how hotly contested that, uh, that ballot has been, uh, and hope that as um, more uh, people become uh, engaged in Colorado rulemaking that uh, folks will continue to, uh, you know, engage in, in, in this process, in the, in the Colorado process to ensure uh, that community voices are, uh, you know, heard and considered uh, throughout uh, their uh, one-year rulemaking program. Uh, one of the challenges here in Oregon is that, uh, you know, Colorado has a one-year rulemaking uh, period, whereas uh, we in Oregon have had the benefit of two years to deeply consider uh, the issues. So it's um, kind of anticipated that uh, other states will give kind of strong deference to the decisions that we've made here in Oregon. So um, the, the hope is that uh, community will continue to uh, advocate and, uh, and educate uh, around these issues so that uh, the, the laws that, that get kind of the regulations that get adopted there uh, really are informed by uh, the, like the people who will be using those services and the people uh, who actually understand psychedelics in and in in other than a merely academic uh, way. Um, so as mentioned, uh, we are in the final phase of a long and arduous uh, rulemaking period. Uh, the Measure 109 creates a two-year rulemaking period that began in January of last year and ends uh, next month. And we are here at the final stretch where uh, by December 30th, the Oregon Health Authority will adopt uh, the ultimate rules that will govern uh, the program. Um, as mentioned earlier, uh, this is kind of our last chance to really get input into this because, uh, in, in, which is extra important because uh, there is expected to be significant deference given to the Oregon uh, rules. So um, this is kind of uh, the last call, uh, kind of a call to action to, uh, for people to, to speak out in ways that uh, feel aligned and feel um, uh, consistent with uh, their values. Uh, and so what we're going to offer today in this uh, webinar is kind of a review, uh, kind of a, a, a technical rules analysis uh, of some of these rules and the ways that they're anticipated to affect equity issues in the Oregon 109 program um, with the understanding that there, this may not be uh, kind of a Measure 9 101 uh, a program. Uh, I'll post some uh, links in the chat uh, later that will uh, give uh, people a more cursory kind of introduction if that's what they're seeking. Uh, but, but this uh, lecture today uh, and, the, and the discussion, the community discussion that follows uh, we'll sort of assume a certain level of uh, knowledge already about the kind of the, the core tenets of the 109 system. And uh, so um, with the rulemaking period, uh, there's two ways people can give comment. Uh, you can give a uh, verbal uh, comment at three public comment hearings that are going to be uh, scheduled between November 15th, 16th, and 17th at these dates provided here on the slide. Um, and you have to sign up in advance to speak at that, uh, so or at any one of those. Um, and there is uh, a links for that that will also uh, be posted here. In fact, we'll go ahead and post those now. And if perchance uh, people are inclined to do that and to give comment, I would uh, strongly recommend uh, going in uh, right now and uh, signing up because time has a way of getting away uh, from us and uh, just encourage you to uh, sign up now so that you don't forget it if you're going to. Uh, so just take a moment if, if, that's, uh, if that speaks to you. Um, and also uh, all the way through 5 p.m. Pacific on the November 21st, you can also uh, email any comments, any concerns, uh, any 
anything you think that the state of Oregon should know before it uh, finally adopts uh, these rules. So this is our last chance as community to uh, educate around these uh, really important matters in what I believe to be the world's first regulated psychedelic services program that is, uh, you know, government uh, sanctioned and government endorsed uh, for an adult use uh, program. So the kind of big picture uh, items that we're going to be uh, talking about today uh, are uh, kind of issues about uh, client affordability, uh, about um, professional affordability for people who want to work in this program and the kind of the cost uh, barriers that exist for those folks. Um, we're going to touch a little bit on uh, some cultural equity uh, within the 109 system. Um, also, data privacy and data management, as well as uh, ways that the rules uh, can or prevent monopolies uh, or, or do better uh, at preventing uh, monopolies. So, um, and it, just to mention, uh, this isn't uh, by any means an exhaustive list of all of the, the concerns. And uh, if there are things that uh, I've omitted uh, during this discussion, uh, please uh, feel free to jump in during the Q&A uh, at the end and uh, help fill in some of those gaps. Um, so with respect to the question of client affordability under the 109 system, uh, the cost of services is really expected to arrive from basically four different factors. Um, the most uh, kind of onerous uh, of those has uh, widely uh, and previously been predicted to be uh, the cost of the facilitator, uh, the facilitation assistance that is required uh, to, to supervise um, uh, administration sessions. Um, we also have uh, products uh, and products testing and all of that that goes into the cost of a, of a, of a session and the uh, the service center itself will uh, either charge rent uh, to an independent contractor or will also have its own overhead that it needs to, um, you know, uh, have covered uh, in the cost of services. And then, uh, of course, there is uh, additionally travel that's required to get to service centers, which uh, affects people uh, in rural areas, perhaps more than in urban areas. Um, and thanks to the advocacy of a couple of different uh, counties, uh, advocates, uh, they're some people won't have to travel nearly as far, mm -hmm. uh, but where uh, I live in Ontario, Oregon, I believe the closest uh, place that's going to have uh, lawful access is in the uh, it's the Bend area. So it will probably be about a four or four and a half hour drive to get there from from where I'm at. So uh, that is another uh, non negligible uh, piece of the uh, overall puzzle. Um, so when we talk about the facilitation costs that are going to be uh, present within 109, um, there's kind of uh, what I like to call the facilitation cost floor, uh, which is calculated by a couple of different rules that the state has uh, promulgated or, or, or proposed here within these draft rules. And um, so the, the kind of structure that the state has devised for arriving at this uh, minimum cost floor for facilitation is based on kind of mostly uh, what dose range a, uh, a person is uh, going to take uh, within, uh, within their session. Mm -hmm. And the dose is determined, uh, the, the dose determines basically two separate variables. Uh, one of those is uh, what the state is saying is a minimum facilitator to client ratio that must be adhered to in every instance. Uh, you can go, that's a minimum ratio, so you're welcome to have more facilitation than is required, uh, but it doesn't uh, necessarily provide like a safe harbor so that uh, facilitators will uh, always be able to rely on these numbers uh, to determine what a safe uh, amount of uh, facilitation assistance is required for a given ceremony. And what I mean by th uh, these minimum ratios are not a safe harbor. If a, if a facilitator walks in, even if the regulations uh, legally allow them to uh, operate at a, at a ratio of one to 25, meaning one facilitator to 25 clients uh, for, a, for a five milligram or less uh, dose, uh, that doesn't mean that it's necessarily responsible or safe for them to do so. And there's a number of uh, factors that would go into uh, what is actually safe. Uh, and, it, and reliance on these uh, ratios is not expected to be 
uh, safe harbor that would absolve, uh, you know, basically uh, facilitator from uh, kind of facilitation malpractice if they were to to give uh, 25 people who are totally psychedelically naive a half gram, uh, who may have uh, contraindications. Uh, or, or things that uh, would suggest that they require more assistance, now, the facilitator likely uh, in tort law and otherwise uh, may not be able to just say that because of uh, these ratios that it was uh, responsible uh, or uh, a, a good professional judgment for them to, to divert to these ratios. Um, so, so that's what is meant sort of by uh, this is the floor, not necessarily where most uh, sessions will always uh, end up. Um, and so this is, there's a similar a minimum ratio, uh, duration for each session that's also dose dependent. And so when you kind of combine these two factors, you kind of get at how many uh, minutes or hours uh, would each client uh, within a given dose range, assuming that uh, the, the group size is as large as can be had within a, a given dose range, uh, and that the session is just the absolute legal minimum or the regulatory minimum, uh, we can arrive at, uh, at an amount of time that each client at, at the absolute regulatory minimum uh, would be responsible uh, for paying their facilitator. Uh, so this is kind of the, the unit system that would uh, basically factor uh, kind of the, the absolute minimum, right? So it doesn't mean that every client is going to be ready to leave uh, after the, the session minimum, uh, but it, it, it kind of creates a sort of a, a benchmark uh, for, for this. Um, so, so this is kind of a, a really big piece of this and a really big piece of the affordability uh, within uh, the, the program. Uh, so in this chart, you can see that as the dose goes up, uh, especially at the higher end near the 35 to 50 um, milligram uh, range, which is, of course, uh, roughly 3.5 to 5 uh, grams of dried uh, cubensis uh, fruit body, uh, that amount would essentially, uh, you know, require a minimum of three hours, uh, no matter what. So as you see, uh, the higher up it goes, it kind of raises fairly uh, precipitously, and uh, if people at the higher end kind of are, are stuck kind of paying quite a bit to uh, to, to have a session. So um, the problem with a, a system like this, uh, from, from my point of view, is that it doesn't really provide uh, really flexibility to uh, people who are more experienced with psilocybin or uh, to responsible kind of communities who use this uh, in, in, in responsible ways. Um, so um, I've been promoting uh, before uh, and continue to advocate for a more flexible model uh, that would allow communities and, and individuals to uh, kind of consider a number of idiosyncratic factors uh, when arriving at the amount of facilitation that's actually uh, needed for a given session. Uh, so, you know, the, the idea is that if reliance on these numbers here uh, doesn't necessarily uh, mean that it's safe, and it doesn't mean that the uh, uh, that the client is or that the facilitator is uh, being uh, professionally responsible. Uh, they're already going to be considering uh, additional factors anyway. So why would we uh, kind of create these anchoring effects that uh, will be kind of hard from a from a training program's perspective to unteach and unlearn and say, even though we're saying the maximum is twenty five to one. Uh, it doesn't mean that you should always expect that that's going to be appropriate. Uh, so uh, kind of instead, um, considering the actual factors that uh, affect safety uh, would be a better way to, to do this. And this is the list that I've uh, come up with after thinking about it uh, and doing some work around this area uh, to, to that really uh, dial that in, uh, which includes a consideration of the people's uh, potential like clients' experience uh, in, in working in a, in a peer support uh, kind of role. Um, so this is one thing that particularly along this higher uh, a range of, uh, of, of dose uh, could really help continue to drive the price down in a, in a, in a way that, that makes sense within the context of um, you know, responsible community type use. Um, so uh, in addition to uh, the kind of uh, facilitation costs, uh, you know, that, that would 
kind of limit the affordability uh, of the program. Uh, I also wanted to mention a, a couple of positives uh, from the rules that, uh, that, that do help promote uh, equity where the state, uh, in my view, had, had kind of appeared likely to not do some of these things uh, and, and ultimately has, uh, has, has proposed to do them now, uh, particularly the screening on an on a annual basis. Uh, so what this really optimizes for is um, people who access psilocybin through the 109 program repeatedly, uh, meaning uh, people who microdose or people who, who have it in a more community uh, use kind of format, uh, they'll be able to, um, you know, not have to pay for uh, screening when uh, they've already gone through it once, uh, unless there's some kind of change in their uh, kind of health uh, or, or uh, circumstances. Um, so just want to mention that, uh, you know, the, the session durations uh, uh, seemed uh, reasonable. Uh, and on the lower end, especially of these dosing ranges uh, and this, uh, you know, this cost floor, um, you know, these numbers here didn't seem uh, to me, to my thinking, to be particularly onerous, um, you know, 2.4 to 16 minutes or th even 30 minutes of a, of a, of a facilitator's time uh, is on average not, not horrible, uh, but, you know, it's still um, kind of uh, there's still affordability challenges here. So um, in terms of cultural equity under uh, Measure 109, uh, wanted to just highlight uh, some, some of the, the big touch points here uh, under the draft rules. Um, the, the big picture items uh, are uh, in terms of cultural equity, uh, whether uh, first off the, the actual appearance of services, uh, the, the, the paradigm and the, and the mode of services uh, being culturally sensitive uh, and be allowing for kind of a range of activities that are um, kind of culturally appropriate, uh, things that might be look uh, religious in a certain way, or there might be other types of um, uses, uh, are, are, are really one of the, the, the bigger uh, touchstone items. And then, um, and then whether the people who operate within the 109 system, both from uh, facilitators and from, from other operators, including service centers, uh, really are reflective of, of the diversity within the broader population. Um, we've seen already uh, some, some significant uh, data from uh, an earlier community interest survey that OHA put out showing that uh, BIPOC uh, communities uh, are, are are really not very well, uh, not expected to be well represented at all uh, within uh, the program. So uh, the more types of uh, kind of cultural uh, uh, flexibility for, for different um, use, use types um, and, and more affordability uh, really helps to make this a more uh, culturally sensitive and inclusive program. Um, and then lastly, the, the kind of big item is, um, you know, just the flexibility in dosing. So the, the draft rules purport or, or propose to limit the maximum amount of psilocybin that can be taken in a, in a single session to 50 milligrams, uh, which is approximately equivalent to five grams of dried weight, uh, which will probably be more than a lot of people will want. But given the wide variability in people's uh, metabolic rates, uh, as well as uh, pe some people's desire to have a much deeper uh, experience, um, you know, five milligram, 50 milligrams may not be enough for some people. And of course, if uh, that is, uh, if that, if, they, if a person does want to do more than 50 milligrams, uh, these rules would prohibit them from doing that within the 109 system and force them to do it outside of uh, 109, which would, of course, uh, arguably be uh, less safe uh, outside of the 109 container uh, without professional assistance on hand uh, from people who are licensed and trained uh, to, to do that work. So, um, you know, the it, it really leaves a lot of people out of, uh, out of the service center when they do not uh, have that option. So in terms of the activities that are allowed during the administration, I, I think uh, OHA did a, did a fairly good job of uh, drafting rules that created uh, quite a bit of flexibility. Um, the main limitation on it really seems to be pretty uh, vague and also pretty uh, you know, appropriate. 
uh, activities that harass, threaten, or physically harm uh, anyone uh, are prohibited. So um, if that's the limit, then that leaves quite a bit of room for, uh, you know, ceremonial work or, uh, you know, a community work. Uh, it leaves room for kind of more wellness spas. It leaves room for uh, basically any of the types of paradigm, uh, in any of the, the major use paradigms for psilocybin, uh, as long as it's done responsibly and safely uh, and reasonably. So um, that I think was a, was a significant um, kind of uh, win uh, within this, uh, that it, it doesn't require people to necessarily always wear eye shades and headphones and have a more inward facing journey. Although uh, of course there's room for that too, um, it allows for more uh, social uh, type of uh, uh, sessions as well. Um, it also, the rules do provide uh, allowance for people to come in who are not uh, necessarily clients or facilitators into these uh, sessions, uh, provided that clients give consent. And so this uh, creates some opportunity for um, teachers, uh, spiritual leaders, or religious leaders, or uh, musicians, or other types of uh, performance artists uh, to come and uh, kind of uh, work within uh, 109, um, and, and also, you know, give, uh, of course, clients a, a wider range of experiences that are available uh, within the program. Um, one of the things that comes up frequently is the use of touch, and there are some uh, significant uh, limitations there. Uh, so, um, hugs uh, from the facilitator to the client and, you know, are allowed and also the facilitator is allowed to uh, place her hands on a client's uh, hand or shoulders. Um, no other type of touch is allowed. Um, there seems to be kind of an ambiguity in the rule. Uh, it's not clear whether clients and group administrations are um, allowed to touch one another um, except for supportive touch as defined by uh, this reg here, which says specifically, um, you know, the, the, that the facilitator is allowed to do it. So um, I've emailed uh, OHA and asked for clarification on this and they've taken note of it, but didn't feel like they were at liberty to give uh, an explanation or a response to what specifically that was intended to mean, uh, but they've noted it. And I think we'll see some clarity around that in the final rules, but they're, th those are the limits on touch. And then finally, um, the, the thing that really might be a, a potentially really significant limitation uh, is that group administration sizes, like the size of the group is limited to 25 people. And while uh, in synthesis style or you know, retreat style uh, gatherings, uh, you know, 25 uh, people is probably larger than many uh, group sizes will, will normally be, uh, but this limits the ability to have um, more like like musical offerings or festival type things. So this would stop, uh, like for instance, like a like a meow wolf uh, type of uh, institution from uh, operating as a service center, uh, or at least from being very big. If they're limited to just twenty five uh, people at a time, uh, it, it'll just be a significant limitation on that. Um, one of the reasons why this particular rule uh, concerns me is that um, within the 109 system, the role of the facilitator is sort of uh, somewhere between on the one side, uh, like a Zindo harm reduction volunteer. Uh, and on the other side, we have, uh, you know, licensed uh, psychedelic therapists, uh, psychotherapists uh, who have lots and lots of training. Uh, and so the 109 facilitator is probably somewhere in the middle of that. And at the end of these 160 hour training programs, when the training program says you are qualified to provide psilocybin services uh, within that range where the 109 facilitator will occupy, um, those uh, facilitators will probably be closer to a more harm reduction uh, style uh, qualification uh, than they will be the psychotherapists that can do um, deeper work in, in many instances. Uh, and if, that program in order to make sure that people are uh, actually working within the scope of the of their skill uh, it's appropriate that there be enough offerings within the program that will uh, reflect their skill sets and if uh, 
if if that's uh, limited to 25 people, I think instead of having uh, festival type uh, offerings under 109, uh, there will be a uh, a limit on. Um, I think what we'll see is in practice a lot of facilitators are taking on more ambitious work than they're really. Uh, uh, should be. Um, so I think it kind of creates uh, a, a system where, um, you know, people are doing more involved work than, than perhaps uh, they're prepared. And of course, the hope is that uh, facilitators will uh, be um, humble uh, in, in acknowledging their limitations, but, um, but, but, this, but, but this kind of uh, number may uh, limit uh, uh, how, how often uh, that, that happens. Um, so then we have uh, affordability for the professionals uh, who wish to operate within the program. And so there's really a few factors that really uh, kind of drive or influence uh, this analysis. Um, first off, we have the licensing fees for uh, all people who, who seek licensing, uh, as well as application fees. Uh, the cost of regulatory compliance are really significant, particularly around uh, service centers and manufacturers. Um, and then for facilitators, there's a training program tuition they'll have to pay. So these are the kind of uh, uh, things that will uh, kind of create the paywalls and the barriers to uh, for professionals who wish to to work uh, with psilocybin in Oregon. Uh, of these, um, there is uh, quite a bit of discussion that's happened around uh, the licensing fees. So. To start, uh, OHA is obligated under Measure 109 to assess licensing fees that will cover the, the funds of the, the operation of the whole program. Uh, at present, I think there's eight full-time employees uh, in the psilocybin services division. And I think they've uh, identified the need for a total of 25 uh, people. Uh, so that's a fairly large agency uh, that's fairly expensive. And that means that each of these license holders will likely have to pay quite a bit in order to uh, meet their statutory obligation uh, of funding uh, basically all of the 109 system. So the proposed rules that Oregon has adopted uh, will say that uh, it, it's a $10,000 uh, licensing fee initially and uh, renewal fees uh, for, for service centers, manufacturers, and testing labs. And for facilitators, it's a $2,000 uh, fee that they're um, pr promoting. And they've given uh, kind of uh, an attempt at an equity, uh, kind of a, a, an equity-based uh, uh, relaxing of that or exception to that, where if you're a nonprofit service center or manufacturer, they would reduce your fee by half. Uh, and if you're an individual uh, service center, uh, or facilitator or manufacturer who is kind of either in one of these kind of low income categories uh, or uh, a veteran, uh, then, then you are also eligible for a 50% reduction. Um, the problem with that is uh, $2,000 is a lot of money uh, for facilitators. And, um, you know, and, and, and these numbers just really feel sort of out of, ba out of balance. Um, so the initial cost to become licensed within any one of these different categories uh, will vary uh, fairly substantially, um, depending on what type of license someone's uh, promoting. And I just want to emphasize, these are really uh, rough estimates. Um, nobody has yet opened a service center uh, or a manufacturer, um, like, you know, under the 109 program. So we don't really know uh, how, uh, how much those will cost, but um, I think projections uh, range at the at the extreme low end, uh, if, if people are kind of cutting corners and trying to do the most equity centered uh, uh, offering in, in any of these categories, I think the the estimates are around a quarter million for a service center and a hundred thousand for a manufacturer. And I think the lowest tuition uh, for a for a training program is around seven thousand uh, dollars roughly. Um, so. Um, those numbers should be somewhat reflective of the fees as opposed to these $2,000, $10,000 uh, figures. So uh, when we're trying to balance them, uh, we have kind of this figure is the cost of opening. And again, based on these, these kind of uh, rough estimates, um, and this is the kind of pr 
proportion of licensing fees that will uh, be each uh, license type would be responsible for. Um, so what we see here is that these facilitators uh, are, are really bearing a, a much like disproportionate uh, amount in relation to the, the cost of entry into the 109 uh, program. Um, and, you know, I think they've been kind of uh, unloaded on uh, kind of a, a disproportionate burden. Uh, and in, in many ways, facilitators are the most vulnerable of all, uh, op, you know, license types within 109. They're the, the folks who will be, I think, frequently uh, least well resourced uh, and, and most financially vulnerable. Uh, and and um, it, I think it only makes sense on a certain level to kind of have uh, this chart uh, look a little more like this so that their fees are proportioned to their out-of-pocket costs uh, or else or else it just kind of uh, creates uh, paywalls uh, that, that aren't necessarily um, uh, proportionate. And so um, if, if those were balanced differently, uh, subsequent renewal applications could be based on a percentage of, of that income. Uh, and that would uh, really make sure that people who are attempting to operate on, on the low end and provide really affordable services are really only paying their fair share and, and really aren't in effect uh, subsidizing big, uh, bigger, uh, more profit-driven uh, operators. Um, so that, that's one thing that the state could do to really help uh, kind of uh, balance that and, and, and remove some of these, um, these barriers. Um, so within the client privacy uh, side of things, uh, we have some uh, pretty challenging uh, information uh, that's come out uh, in these rules um, where essentially uh, all clients within the client confident uh, 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 agreement form, the state mandated client agreement form, the, the proposal uh, is that all clients must consent to having their data shared with the state. Um, and it's supposed to be de-identified uh, data that's being shared um, but uh, there's been uh, quite a bit of recent criticism, uh, including uh, this uh, recent article by Mason Marks, who is the former uh, chair of the licensing subcommittee, and I think might be uh, here with us today. Uh, hi, Mason. Uh, and uh, about some of the privacy and uh, security challenges and, and, the, and, the, and the limitations on, on information that's de-identified uh, and how it's, even though it's de-identified, it's... Uh, reconstitutable, uh, particularly in the in the era of uh, bulk data and, and AI. Um, so there's concern that uh, client confidences could be um, you know, disclosed, and it really ought to be up to the client to uh, decide whether they share that information and with whom, as opposed to mandatorily requiring all clients to always participate. Um, so the an, another uh, concern around uh, client uh, privacy and client data is that um, if a person is um, recording their uh, their session, uh, if, even if a client has given consent, uh, the draft rules say that consent may be withdrawn at any time, uh, which presumably includes during the administration session itself. Uh, and I kind of liken the recording of sessions similar to a uh, police body cam. Uh, you know, uh, if, 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 a, if a police officer has that, uh, it protects uh, the client from police abuse, and it also protects the uh, police from uh, 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 abuse from, uh, you know, the public or so, sort of thing. Uh, not that I think that happens uh, really ever, <laughs> but I think they more often benefit the client than the, than the officer, um, although... Um, you know, they, those uh, cams can be used in, uh, in, in prosecutions too. Um, but the, the idea is that um, this just provides uh, clear accountability for, uh, you know, clients and facilitators, and it keeps uh, people sort of uh, accountable, uh, and it provides uh, some clear um, uh, uh, evidence of, of what actually happens in a session where uh, people are in altered states. And I think um, the idea that it could be withdrawn mid-session uh, could potentially leave uh, facilitators exposed uh, to spurious claims if uh, if they if they shut it off mid-session. 
Um, so, so that's that's a concern uh, that that I've heard raised. Um, and then uh, there is a mandatory uh, five-year uh, retention of all videos that are recorded, which uh, seems like a long time uh, to, to hold them when uh, essentially this is still illegal under federal law. Uh, that will be uh, uh, kind of a long record to, to, to maintain. Um, so we also have uh, finally uh, this, uh, this community practitioner framework. Uh, uh, so I think probably many of you are aware of uh, the prior entheogenic framework uh, was uh, voted on by the equity subcommittee by uh, 11 to 0 vote in favor of it, uh, as well as the licensing subcommittee by a 4 to 1 vote. Um, we had basically this, this proposal that would create a more horizontal community centered uh, paradigm for services within the 109 program. Uh, that was kind of uh, rejected by the full board by a 10-3 vote uh, in May, uh, apparently based on a Department of Justice memorandum that uh, really seemed to be based on some misunderstandings and misreadings of the framework. Um, it's The uh, DOJ memo has been criticized uh, in, in legal uh, blogs uh, by uh, at, at Harris Brickin and, and I believe elsewhere. Uh, as being based on a misunderstanding of the, the framework. And essentially, uh, this, is not, this is not a dead issue. Uh, you know, the, the, the fact that that framework um, was, was, was rejected by the board uh, is not dispositive on OHA. Uh, OHA is, receives recommendations, but they're not obligated to, to follow those. Um, so, you know, there is, uh, there's been a, a revision to it, and uh, Chakruna just published an article that I wrote yesterday um, highlighting some of the um, amendments to the framework in light of some of the criticisms from the DOJ memo. Uh, so we've cleaned it up. We've added some uh, pieces that really um, take it out of its religious uh, kind of moorings and into a more community-based, uh, religiously neutral uh, kind of container. Uh, and so the hope is that uh, that the state will uh, once again uh, consider uh, this and uh, really create good precedent uh, for all other states uh, that follow uh, Oregon's uh, model in, in our in our in our example. Um, so once again, uh, this is uh, time for public comment, and we have uh, basically. Uh, you know, a couple of weeks left to do this. Uh, 15th, 16th, and 17th are the, the hearings, um, and you can email anytime between now and 5 p.m. on the 21st. Um, so, yeah, thank you all for uh, listening, and we will uh, open it up for uh, public uh, discussion. Uh, okay. Thank you. Maybe folks can see that. So there that is again. Uh, this is facilitation cost floor. Yeah. Okay. Um, Kimberly asked, is 2000 every year for license? Uh, is license renewal yearly? And is renewal the same cost as the initial fee? That's a great question. Uh, yes, uh, 2000, it is the initial and the renewal fees every year uh, will be $2,000 under the rules as proposed. Um, uh, and Drew has asked, you mentioned the rules allow for musicians, religious practitioners, et cetera, to be in the sessions. What provisions allow that? And is, is it that they would be considered client support persons? Um, so there's a rule that says that uh, that clients, uh, you know, may not be um, that nobody other than facilitators and clients may be in client administration areas during an administration session uh, unless a client specifically consents to it. Um, and so that is um, kind of uh, uh, the basis for that. And um, and I, I don't have a site uh, like off the top of my head uh, right now, but. Um, uh, I can see. chat is disabled from my vantage point. Okay, well, at least 
Uh, and I'm sorry, I'm such a Luddite. I don't know even how to really work uh, Zoom appropriately. I don't know if uh, Alexa is able to um, open up the chat to make it less uh, restrictive. Um, sorry, the only option appears to be the Q&A uh, feature uh, here right now. Um, uh, Peter asks, is it possible to reduce license fees based on disability status, or is that not allowed due to being a protected class? Uh, that's a great question. Um, it is likely not, I don't believe that's allowed uh, because it's a protected class. Um, and, but there are, so the, the challenge is to find some other proxy that wouldn't um, discriminate. Um, potentially, and, and this it, admittedly isn't my uh, area of, of, of legal expertise. Um, and so if anybody else has a uh, comment or, or input on that, uh, feel free to throw it in the, the Q&A uh, here. Um, Ryan asked, is your PowerPoint going to be available? Uh, sure, uh, you can email me if you like, uh, my, I'll put my email here uh, in the chat. It's, um, and you can uh, reach out and I'd be happy to, actually, if you wanna throw your email in, I'll record that and I'll uh, send it along uh, uh, here momentarily. Anybody who wants uh, this, I'm, I'm happy to, to port it. So feel free. Um, uh, Noah asks, uh, what do for-profit training programs like Intertrek, who will have hundreds of students that pay $8,000 a year, pay into the Oregon Psilocybin program? Um, that's an interesting question. So generally speaking, because uh, there's only four license types and really no... Um, you know, and one of those is not uh, training programs. Uh, you know, training programs pay to have their um, initial curriculum approved by the state. Uh, and then I think it has to be renewed, I want to say every five years after that. And the cost of those uh, applications, uh, I believe, is only supposed to be as much as the cost is for the state to review those applications. Uh, so no amount of, uh, uh, my understanding is that no amount of funds from training programs will help kind of offset licensing fees or any other uh, costs that everyone, all other uh, kind of 109 businesses have to pay. Uh, and it's almost such that you would think that a person behind a training program uh, might have drafted uh, or been close to the drafting of the, the Measure 109 law, because <laughs> uh, that seems to be uh, kind of exactly uh, the case there. Uh, so it's it's not really um, there's there's not a clear uh, uh, payment that's required for training programs, uh, with the with the exception of uh, tr practicum training. So as as probably many of you here know. Uh, during the first couple of generations of the 109 uh, training cohorts, there's not going to be uh, an operational program. There's no facilitators, there's no service centers, uh, there's no product. Uh, and so the first few cohorts uh, will, at least the first one and possibly two or three or more, depending on what part of the state you live in, uh, may not have access to psilocybin. So if if psilocybin is not, if a train, if a if a service center as a practicum site is not available to the client within a reasonable, uh, within reason, uh, the, the training program can still train without um, necessarily working with psilocybin in its practicum. I think most clients, or sorry, most facilitators and, and most training programs would prefer uh, to, to, to work with psilocybin during training, but it's not actually a legal requirement, but I think most of them will probably want to do that and there will be some uh, kind of interaction with uh, service centers for that, uh, which may incidentally result in some uh, fees going to the state uh, for, for for that. But um, and they may open their own service centers to have more autonomy in that. But uh, but in general, um, there's 
their uh, training programs are kind of the one uh, business type that's not actually licensed and it's uh, not actually, um, yeah, probably going to uh, feed that program very much. Uh, uh, Jess, Jesse uh, asks, uh, proposed uh, OAR 333-333-44001D prohibits, quote, uh, on-site consumption of any intoxicant by any individual except for clients consuming psilocybin products during an administration session. Um, yeah, that's, uh, I think many people take issue with referring to psilocybin as an intoxicant. Uh, I was talking, uh, I did an interview with Jonathan Goldman a while ago, and he actually says that one of the uh, problems with thinking about this uh, as an intoxicant is it really reflects uh, what he calls the intoxication model, uh, which puts it in a similar category to alcohol, uh, which uh, may not necessarily uh, actually be like that at all. Uh, so it might be a very different um, experience. And I actually took issue with the use of the word intoxicant within that uh, reg, but um, we'll see um, what happens. Uh, we've got a comment or a question from Michael. Uh, what forms of psilocybin are permitted under the rules? Teas, elixirs, uh, flavored edibles, question mark. Um, so within the uh, products uh, piece, and, and just to be clear, uh, products rules were adopted back, I believe, in either May or June. Uh, so these are not really uh, topics for live discussion uh, during this round of public comment. Uh, so this is um, kind of uh, you know, not really necessarily um, as relevant to to the focus of, uh, you know, kind of these rules and public comment. Uh, but uh, essentially, there are uh, several uh, in, uh, types of products that, that can exist. At a high level, you have a whole dried uh, fruit body, you have uh, extracts, and then you have like homogenate, which means basically, uh, you know, mushroom or potentially even, I believe, mycelium uh, that get, or hyphae that get grinded up and kind of uh, homogenized or, or uniform, made uniform uh, so that the potency is consistent throughout the entire uh, batch. Because as, uh, as probably many know, uh, you know, testing the, the full fruit body, uh, there's a lot of inconsistencies between fruiting bodies and even within parts of a single fruiting body. So uh, those, the accuracy along those lines uh, becomes uh, more and more uh, challenged. Um, but um, there is a, a, a food, uh, kind of a food products uh, allowance that will, um, you know, I, I think result in likely, you know, chocolates and edibles and, and uh, tinctures uh, and, and things like that, that uh, folks can um, can take within within 109. Um, so we've got a question from Anonymous. Uh, are there any expected negative reactions expected from the Oregon Board of Psycho Psychologist Examiners or other credentialing bodies if a clinician becomes a facilitator? Um, this is kind of, in some ways, the million dollar question. Uh, I don't think that there has been, uh, from what I've heard, uh, and, and admittedly, this is a kind of an issue that I haven't been following as closely as some others. Um, I've not heard that any licensing body is projected to um, necessarily take uh, disciplinary action against a, a license, like a, a, somebody who's licensed in a different profession. Um, for their participation in 109. It uh, doesn't mean it couldn't happen. Uh, so I can't say that that you're 100% safe from any types of uh, consequences that could um, uh, come up with that. But um, it is, uh, with particularly within the psychologist examiners, I know I, I was for a while following some of the meeting minutes from their uh, group uh, as they, they met. And it seems like, uh, I think back in October through December and January, uh, going last year into this year, 
uh, there was uh, considerable surprise expressed, I think, by many on that particular board that uh, 109 wasn't a psychotherapeutic uh, program, that it, that it really was a um, kind of a supervised adult use program. Uh, so the fact that they had initially believed it to be, you know, psychotherapeutic in its orientation uh, to me suggests that they weren't so opposed to it uh, because I think they thought it was exclusively theirs as opposed to something that they have to share with uh, other professions or people who aren't uh, necessarily like licensed otherwise. Uh, so, so I actually, I, I haven't been following uh, it uh, on an ongoing basis, but I, I don't, uh, I have not heard that they are um, likely to, to take action, but, but, but again, uh, I encourage people to do their own kind of independent, like uh, looking into that. Uh, got a note from Ann, uh, oh, wanting to power, see the PowerPoint, so we can definitely um, do that and have some more um, requests for the PowerPoint. Um, got a uh, question from Heather. Are Jackson, Deschutes, and Phoenix counties the only counties in Oregon that will provide services? Uh, no, uh, it's a great question. Uh, so those were the two count the two counties, and actually Phoenix is a city in uh, I think it's in Jackson County in Southern Oregon uh, that that had a vote and that the vote went in favor of psilocybin as opposed to the ban on psilocybin. Uh, there's a I think a majority of Oregon residents live in areas in, in cities or counties uh, that didn't even have a vote on their ballot at all, and I think that ended up being about 2.5 million people uh, according to some numbers that I saw. Uh, that were not even, uh, it was not even a question of whether uh, they would, there would be a local ban. So um, a majority of Oregon residents are, will live in clo closer proximity uh, to, to service centers, uh, depending on, on how many open up in, in these different communities across the state. But um, uh, so like a lot of the bigger, uh, more kind of uh, urban uh, or, or liberal or left-leaning uh, areas um, didn't even put it on the ballot at all, including Multnomah County, including, uh, interestingly, Medford, Oregon, uh, including Ashland, and including Lane County, and Eugene, and a lot of places. So um, there's a lot of uh, work that went into dissuading uh, some of those uh, county uh, commissions and city councils uh, to not do that. And uh, I think, you know, we got some good, good results uh, from that. Um, another um, comment from Jesse. Uh, this would seem to prohibit using the facilities for other modalities like ketamine, cannabis, and in the future, MDMA. This would be very detrimental to the economics of a center and to client experience. Is this the intent of the rule or is it meant to prohibit partying type intoxication? That's a really interesting uh, question. So, uh, there is something within the draft rules that says that a uh, service center under 109 is not allowed to be a medical facility, um, which means it can't really be like a hospice, a house, um, or like a, a like a medical like a hospital or anything like that. Um, so I don't think that all uh, ketamine like therapy uh, clinics necessarily fit that definition, but um, I'm not actually sure about that. But I do know that things like uh, cannabis uh, would, would not be allowed um, at a service center, uh, even though I think a lot of people uh, who have um, kind of become anxious in a, in a psilocybin experience, uh, I, I know it's, it's not uncommon for some folks to use cannabis as a way of like kind of uh, unwinding from the anxiety at the end of a um, a session, uh, but unfortunately, under the rules, that's not going to be allowed. And so, um, you know, people are just kind of uh, on their own to come up with some other way uh, in instances where where that sort of thing happens. Um, well, Brian, hey Brian, uh, if we want to support you in suggesting any of the changes that you propose, is there a way to do that? 
Would joining together somehow increase effectiveness? Oh my gosh, I, I'm really sorry we don't have like an option to uh, have like verbal comment because I uh, actually thought this would be more uh, dialogical. So thanks for uh, listening to me just kind of prattle on here for like a really long time. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, uh, so um, I think in terms of the public comment that I'm, uh, you know, not necessarily related to uh, Portland Psychedelic Society because that's a nonprofit and they're not allowed to uh, make, uh, you know, influencing legislation as a substantial part of their activities. Um, and, and this also isn't necessarily expressly tied through psychedelics today. Uh, it's, it's really just more of like my own kind of personal uh, effort and initiative uh, in this. But in terms of the areas where uh, coordinating around public comment could be potentially uh, highly effective um, are really uh, around, I, I think, the issues that 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 I uh, see, and, and I mean, I would definitely um, encourage others to, to kind of chime in uh, here if, uh, you know, on, on, on issues that, that I haven't covered that that are of concern to, to folks, um, you know, but but the ones that that I uh, see really have been largely kind of contained within the community, a practitioner framework. I don't know. Um, I'm going to stop just screen sharing here. Um, there was a um, an article that just got published in Shakruna just, um, I think, yesterday that I wrote about kind of the revision to the framework and, um, you know, how to create kind of a more horizontal model and, um, you know, and, and this has been repurposed. So uh, with the DOJ memo, uh, th it just seemed like uh, there was kind of a kind of a, a legal pretext that uh, that they used that really wasn't necessarily even accurate. And the question is, uh, did they know at the time that they uh, wrote that memo that it was based on a misunderstanding uh, of the of the framework? And, and and I think we'll give them the benefit of the doubt and say that they may not might not have known they might not have read it as carefully or may not have uh, listened to the licensing subcommittee presentation where it was described uh, fairly clearly uh, that that it that it's not meant to favor religious organizations. So that was really the crux of the of the criticism for the DOJ memo was that any uh, program can't give preferences to religious groups over non-religious groups. Um, particularly under the Oregon Constitution and also under the Establishment Clause. And so we actually drafted that in uh, to specifically avoid that and named it in a footnote to the framework that they reviewed saying, uh, because the Oregon Constitution protects non-religious people, uh, we can't make a, a wholly separate uh, framework like that. So, um, you know, they... Uh, Kind of refused uh, to, uh, invitations to to meet and to discuss uh, that, and um, and I kind of sent clarifying uh, emails and a, and a twenty page uh, kind of uh, article policy uh, paper, really going into fairly great depth into to that. Uh, and instead of being kind of met with uh, open arms and and, and being received, uh, I was told uh, actually a couple of different organizations that I was involved that that was. Uh, trying to reach OHA to discuss these things in an open and, um, you know, uh, dialogical, you know, uh, open, you know, way, uh, we were just told uh, that we needed to, uh, quote, let the process run, meaning let the vote happen without any uh, discussion. Uh, and then so we were really surprised when uh, letting the process run means waiting for them to strategically uh, time the release of a, of a legal memorandum uh, following a, a closed session meeting of the board. Uh, and, um, you know, so so that's kind of like, like the, the backstory uh, for that. And, um, you know, we are really hoping that, um, that this goes, but there's just a, some, an opportunity for uh, continued dialogue around these issues and a, uh, um, you know, more uh, softening of this so that it doesn't have to be a really buttoned up a lab coat version of psychedelic services. So um, some of you probably have seen uh, Michael Pollan's documentary uh, series uh, called How to Change Your Mind. Um, at the end of that, he touches on 
this tension that has long existed, uh, really since um, psychedelics have kind of been in the mainstream West, going back to Aldous Huxley, this tension between uh, should psychedelics be a more populist uh, thing, should they be available to all people, uh, or is it something that's really only available to the elite and to uh, like the privileged? And essentially, I think there's that tension that is really kind of at the heart of this this debate that's existed in in 109, and that particularly has been kind of uh, come to a head on the community based uh, models. Um, I think there's folks who would rather see uh, a more expensive uh, elitist version uh, because that looks better to people in, in, in conservative areas. Uh, and I think there's concern that if, uh, if 109 uh, really is like a horizontal community thing that lets empowers communities and people as opposed to, you know, uh, looks buttoned up and in, in medi quasi-medical uh, that it would just be sort of uh, off-putting, uh, and um, and so, yeah, that 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 tension I think is is alive and well in Oregon, and it really has has driven the process in in, in favor of a of a more elite way. So I think um, the 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 shorter answer is 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 really that um, to me the the thing that that where Oregon is is really uh, appears to need some. Uh, educational assistance is really uh, in in not making a highly uh, medicalized, highly kind of elite, overpriced uh, program that um, creates paywalls that keep out you know people of mid middle and low income, including 520,000 Oregonians who live in poverty and 210,000 who live in deep poverty. Uh, you know this this program is not going to be accessible uh, to folks along those lines uh, in a, in a meaningful way. Um, so I, I think that those issues, and I think the state has responded to those in some ways, and I think these rules have got better uh, this iteration than the last one, uh, and, and honestly, the, the last one was even, I think, better in some ways than, than it could have been, uh, but it's still uh, not, not good enough, and where in Oregon, where the only option is either you do it with take psilocybin within uh, Measure 109, uh, legally within that legal container, uh, or you do it, uh, or it's illegal if you do it, right? So that's the option. You either take it, you either don't take it, you take it legally in this overpriced uh, system, uh, or or you take it illegally. It creates a special responsibility of the state to make sure that, you know, that it not be sort of a something that perpetuates the drug war, uh, something that doesn't um, you know, continue to um, just divide uh, people along racial class uh, and other uh, divides that already plague uh, society. Um, so, so that's, I mean, um, I'm going to be uh, circulating a list of uh, potential talking points, uh, things that, that, that I've identified as being um, important. And um, I also want to plug uh, Casey uh, Mitchell, has been working on a on a project that would uh, kind of uh, allow people to work on a Google, common Google Doc to identify and comment on um, areas, and I think they're going through uh, their own um, community process for organization, um, which I think is called. Uh, if you're in here, uh, Casey, uh, feel free to jump in and, and add uh, some information. Um, but um, they've been working on it for a while. And here is the link to that, and you can uh, go in and give input. And I think they're going to do a poll where they uh, take sort of like the five uh, most common comments and kind of circulate talking points based on those. Uh, so they've invited uh, me to, to plug that here uh, to invite you all to uh, to give input on that too. So please uh, feel free. And I just uh, threw the, the Google Doc link in the, in the chat. Um. Ryan asks, do you know how the Lux in Multnomah County, how long the Lux takes or where that process goes? Um, that's, a, that's a really uh, complex question. Uh, you can uh, contact the uh, Portland Development uh, uh, Department. They have these 15-minute meetings. You can uh, contact them and uh, ask general questions. 
and they'll do them free up to a point and then I think they start to charge you and expect you to hire uh, people uh, but but they can you can get quite a bit out of those uh, kind of free meetings if you're looking to kind of make sure that you clear all those initial hurdles in terms of uh, zoning and, and, and land use kind of issues um, I don't think that they're uh, starting to uh, accept Lux applications uh, last I heard uh, but uh, I've not been following that uh, super closely uh, either. Uh, Patrick asks, in your opinion, if there was one change to the rules that would achieve the greatest reduction in costs for service for clients, uh, what would it be? It's a really good question. Um, I think the... So clients will come to 109 for a whole lot of different reasons and with a lot of different needs and a lot of different barriers and, uh, and challenges. Um, I think the, in, in my uh, perspective, the, the sort of low hanging equity fruit, if you want to call it that, is really around these facilitator to client ratios. Um, there's only so much they can do on, uh, that the state can do on kind of premise requirements. I mean, they could relax those, they could, uh, make him less, uh, have to have less, uh, like change the bathroom rules to make those more uh, relaxed. And, and there's things like like very specific things like that that they could do uh, to kind of lower the cost of the service center. But um, but once that's done, uh, they're really, um, the, like the service piece, it, I think most people have traditionally projected that uh, the facilitator's uh, cost is really going to be one of the, if probably not the main driver of cost for overall access. Um, and if people are taking a low dose, if people are taking a micro dose, facilitation cost may not be very high. That cost floor is a 1 25th of an hour. So if a even if a client, even if a facilitator charges $100 an hour, I think that turns out to be about four or five dollars uh, would be their fair share uh, along that cost floor. And again, those cost floors don't necessarily, shouldn't necessarily be what most people charge, um, but that is the absolute minimum. And in some cases, like for, for some perceptual doses, if it's truly like a microdose, uh, that or sub hallucinogenic dose, that's probably safe and that would be an individualized decision uh, by uh, people who are considering kind of the factors of the group but um, for the higher dose groups where people are in that 35 to 50 milligram range uh, those folks having to pay three hours uh, kind of as the minimum floor in facilitation time uh, that that puts it at you know if if it's a hundred dollars per hour for a facilitator, uh, and nobody knows in fairness what what it'll be. It could be uh, considerably less than that. It could be um, for some uh, facilitators, it could be quite a bit more than that. Uh, you know, depending on reputation and that sort of thing. But um, to say a minimum of three hours uh, for all people who are going to take it, you know, three and a half grams equivalent. Uh, that's going to really add substantially. So, and it doesn't provide a way for responsible communities to, to use it and, um, you know, purport with proportionality to what the actual safety risks would be. Um, so, so that to me would be kind of the, the easiest and simplest thing that they could do is um, either alter those in a downward direction, which I disfavor, uh, and rather would just say, uh, that 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 these factors have to be considered uh, responsibly uh, by 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 people and and by and that they'd have to be yeah that'd be the basis. Um, um, Jesse asks, where did you find the minimum facilitation length per client? Is that in the OHA rules? I see the minimum session duration, but not minimum facilitation length. Uh, yeah, I, I think I'm using those terms interchangeably, um, the, the length and the duration being kind of the similar uh, thing in my uh, estimation. Um, and I should say that with, within that chart that was up there earlier, that doesn't include uh, screening or preparation or uh, any integration. 
Uh, so I think there's a, I mean, there's definitely a mandatory uh, prep session, at least one, uh, and, and the facilities will probably also charge for screening and that kind of thing. Um, so, so that's not the full picture in all fairness, but, um, but I think those other pieces will probably be um, in many cases, uh, especially on the higher dose side, uh, less than uh, the actual administration session. Uh, but, you know, I think it'll be an interesting question of how much um, in the overall program, uh, how much of the services will be uh, prep and integration versus how many people just want to get their administration session and get out. And I think um, because this is a kind of a consumer driven uh, marketplace, I think we'll see um, kind of uh, that people go different ways uh, with that. Um, another anonymous question, uh, are there groups forming to advocate for changes to the rules as a group? Uh, yes, so that would be, um, so the Theogenic Practitioners Council of Oregon is an organization um, I and some other uh, folks uh, started uh, back in March and uh, we've been uh, kind of doing some advocacy around uh, creating religiously sensitive models um, and more culturally sensitive models uh, for services. Uh, and um, we're continuing to, to work around these things. Um, and I, I just mentioned uh, Casey's uh, group uh, with the link there in the chat, uh, they're actively working on it. And um, I know there's a lot of other uh, folks um, that are doing it and more uh, kind of uh, professional uh, settings, uh, which mean uh, more, um, you know, like medical or therapeutic kind of uh, context. And, and in terms of community uh, organizing happening, um, I think it's it's largely, um, you know, I mean, PPS has been a really great uh, hub for uh, kind of the community conversations around it. And um, yeah, I, I'd say uh, definitely this uh, Casey's um, kind of a Google Doc here is 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 a way to uh, to engage on on that. Um, John says, a note on the word intoxicants. Uh, a number of prescribed drugs function to allow people a modicum of quality of life are considered intoxicants, uh, such as opiates and anti anxiety medications. Uh, people who have concerns about this need to bring it up. Clarification is necessary without excluding these people from facilitating or other roles in administration, including clients themselves. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of uh, interesting uh, question about what will, uh, you know, so there's not really thought to be, um, and another, I think really a positive uh, in my view, um, thing that OHA decided to do uh, with these rules uh, was not to prescribe hardly any uh, hard contraindications, uh, which are things that would say, um, if this condition is present in your situation, that you are uh, permanently forbidden from, from taking psilocybin, uh, or at least temporarily forbidden from taking it within 109. Uh, the reason why I think that's bad is because it would create kind of incentives for clients to be dishonest with facilitators if it becomes known that a person who has, for instance, uh, like a diagnosis of uh, bipolar or schizophrenia uh, may uh, become aware of this and then be dishonest and, and hide it. And we, and the, the fewer such incentives like that, uh, the better. Um, and that's... Um, and, and so the, the one uh, contraindication that uh, I, is, is present is uh, like lithium. And if a person's taken lithium within the last 30 days under these rules, it is a, a hard uh, contraindication. Uh, reason being it's potentially fatal. Um, so, I mean, it makes good sense in that, that limited instance, but in all other instances, um, it, there, there should be some flexibility uh, to have like a nuanced conversation around um, whether that's a good decision and, and if a person just proceeds, uh, how it can be done uh, kind of with the best kind of safety, uh, safeguards kind of in place um, to, to really respond to the, the unique needs of that individual client. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think that's um, kind of a 
part of this that I, I think it also promotes equity because a lot of, I mean, I've uh, had conversations with a few people who have uh, bipolar diagnoses who have said that actually psilocybin in particular has been um, incredibly uh, beneficial in their own uh, self-regulation. Of course, none of that's like scientifically validated at this point, at least not yet, or it might be, I imagine there'll be research on it uh, soon uh, at some point, but um you know, anecdotally, um, there's people who have, uh, that I've talked to who have reported a really a positive outcomes with that. Um, so we are starting to run low on time. We've got scheduled eight minutes. I'm going to try to uh, go through the rest of these fairly quickly. Um, John says, my understanding that 24 to 28 of Oregon's counties had an opt-out measure on the ballot. This means 25 to 21 of the rural counties will not participate. Uh, yeah, I think um, the map of Eastern Oregon is, and I haven't gone through and looked at every uh, county yet uh, or anything like that, but I think it's it's pretty much bone dry from the Idaho border, kind of where I'm at, until you get to Bend uh, in Deschutes County. Um, and, and I think that's just kind of the nature of, uh, of a divided state and a divided uh, country, uh, is that uh, not everyone's going to necessarily agree. And that just means that folks will have to travel further uh, and there'll be less uh, kind of regular access. Um, uh, another question, it seems that unlicensed practitioner and ceremonial activity might flourish considering the 12 gram decrim limit. What do you think of the growth of the underground work that will emerge? Can it be run safely outside of the measure 109 framework? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, there are a, um, so this question, so first off, the decrim under measure 110, uh, I think of as sort of a, a little bit of a misnomer um, because all that it protects is a person who gets uh, caught with the, these personal use possession amounts. Uh, which is under 10 grams uh, of anything with, with psilocybin. So you could have a 11.9 gram chocolate bar that has just a, a speck of psilocybin in it and you're barely under the limit. But if it were a 12 gram bar with just uh, like a 0.1 gram of, or, you know, 0.1 gram of a psilocybin in it, it would be illegal. Um, or you could have, uh, you know, 11.9 grams of pure psilocybin uh, like synthesized psilocybin, and it would be, um, it's still technically illegal, a class E violation, uh, but the consequences of that would be uh, fairly minimal. Um, so what that doesn't allow, though, is uh, people to distribute, people to share, people to manufacture or grow or synthesize or anything like that. So um, in terms of like a, a community space where people can actually come together and, you know, not have to worry about criminal uh, prosecution, uh, that doesn't exist uh, in, in Oregon. Um, so in terms of, I mean, safety can mean a lot of things. It can mean legally safe and it can also mean like actually like physically or mentally safe. Um, and from the criminal perspective, uh, there's there's really not. Uh, a, a good legal option uh, that exists under 110. Um, and, you know, we'll see. Um, I recently gave a, a presentation about a risk analysis in the theogenic uh, religion space uh, about how I think there's probably some major changes we're going to see within the next few years uh, around, around this issue and religious freedom. Um, but until there, that happens, there's just kind of a lot of uh, gray area and a lot of confusion about um, what's legal and what's not. And um, it's very state specific analysis. So if you're not in Oregon, um, definitely, or regardless of where you're at, I uh, want to talk to competent counsel in, in your jurisdiction. Um, B asks, any idea why they're not letting clients to bring their own food? As a person with food, feel Fear, severe food restrictions, this is discriminatory. Um, I don't know for sure. I remember there being some conversation and, and kind of just fear around uh, people bringing in uh, non-food things that they consume, like uh, substances, like other controlled substances or alcohol or something like that. Um, I don't necessarily think that that's like a great uh, 
I mean, it might be overkill for what they're trying to avoid, but um, yeah. Uh, John, feel free to recommend OPSCC uh, available on Meetup, Oregon Psilocybin Service Community Collaborative. Yes, uh, so that is the name of the organization uh, that I just posted the doc to in the, in the chat. Um, I'll post it again in case uh, whoever posted that uh, wasn't here earlier. Um, but there it is. Uh, folks, they are actively soliciting community input on the rules. We'll have a uh, concerted process through which they, um, you know, kind of voice those concerns uh, through, through public comment. That was from Heidi Venture. Oh, thanks, Heidi. Um, just put Oregon Civil Cyber Services Community Collective uh, community collaborative into Google and our meetup comes up. 35 people officially in the group, probably another 15 to 30 involved in addition. Uh, oh, and Casey has put in a link here, which I will also share in the chat. Um, a joint public comment memo. Um, if here's another question from an anonymous questioner. If I have an existing lease on my practice and I want to become a service center, am I correct in understanding my landlord must agree to it officially in licensure application documents for the state? Um, my review of this rule was actually fairly surprising to me. Um, if you are intending to have a manufacturer, um, you are required to present with your licensing application something that would clarify that your landlord's given permission for you to to run a manufacturing operation in the property that you're leasing. Uh, I did not see a similar or equivalent uh, restriction or requirement for uh, service centers that intend to operate. Um, I don't know uh, if that um, if if I just might have missed it or if that just wasn't in there. Um, but that is um, you might be able to, I mean, you should, uh, I, I'll say, uh, you wouldn't, uh, almost certainly most, I think, uh, boilerplate lease agreements prohibit uh, illegal activity, which I think most courts would consider uh, even a service center as illegal activity because of its federal illegality at present. Uh, but, um, but I don't think that would necessarily at present prevent you from getting licensed. Now, if, if, if getting licensed but evicted is probably uh, worse than uh, not getting licensed in the first place, uh, depending on how long uh, you're operating. But um, you, you know, you probably wanna make sure you clear that hurdle uh, before uh, proceeding. Um, another comment, oh, and there's a, another document about uh, this, effort to create community, the OPCSS, OPSCC, sorry, a little dyslexia there. Um, there's uh, some more information about their work. Um, and we are getting really close. Uh, Noah asks, under the COPA studies, they use a 25 milligram dose. So the people who need this most will pay the most. It's like a tax on depression. Yeah. Um, that is um, not wrong. Uh, I think people who go on these higher doses, and, and 25 is still sort of, I think, a reasonable amount of, um, you know, on the facilitation cost floor, I, I forget where it was exactly, but I think it was a fairly reasonable, yeah, 25 milligram dose would be 1.25 hours minimum. Uh, but if you went like 24 milligrams, it would be like 40 minutes. And you know, that's, that's the floor, and that doesn't necessarily mean that that's, like, going to be available. Um, it depends on what the facilitator's uh, judgment really uh, requires or, or, or is. But, um, yeah, that's, um, it's, it's all, uh, it's going to be, there's, there's some, some real challenges here. Um, and I think, that's it. If it does not exist under M109, it is still federally illegal and there is no call memo. That's exactly right. Um, thank you, Noah. Um, that is true, unless you're a religion and you can pass the RIFRA analysis. That's the one exception. 
uh, to federal illegality of psilocybin uh, that might happen under 109. If you are a religious organization, uh, federal Religious Freedom Restoration Act uh, does not allow uh, any kind of uh, discrimination uh, against you unless for there's a compelling government interest and it's the least restrictive means of furthering that compelling interest. So uh, we may see some really interesting uh, things happen within that, but um, but generally speaking, that that's correct. Okay, and then we've got a um, a final uh, comment here from Josh saying that uh, inviting people to look at the local ordinances, land use, and tax videos that uh, were presented within the uh, OHA fall forum um, and the links provided there. It's also on the OHA website. Um, so thank you all for being here today. Um, really appreciate the participation and support. Um, we'll continue to uh, try to do what we can uh, to, to make this program as equitable and affordable uh, as, as we can. Uh, and uh, I hope folks will uh, turn out uh, with passion and enthusiasm for public comment. Uh, again, we have three of them uh, through the hearings, uh, November 15th, 16th, and 17th. Uh, you have till 5 p.m. on Monday, November 21st to email uh, comments. Um, so I'm going to uh, mute my screen here so I can record these uh, emails that people left in so I can send out some PowerPoint uh, presentations. But uh, thank you all uh, tremendously for being here today and I uh, hope you all have a good rest of your evening. Thank you.